this appears to be a cooperative behavior. You know, when you see these swarms you know, flooding across the, the desert, you're thinking, well, they're working together, they're cooperating, much like fish are cooperating when they're moving, or those ungulates are cooperating when they're migrating. Well, in actual fact, it's completely different. Um, it looks the same, but in this case, it's completely driven by aggression and cannibalism among the individuals. That's allowing us to understand why the V-shaped model at a certain level of description is correct, but at another level of description is a very poor descriptor of what's going on. Um, and this is a real danger. When you see these types of patterns, these are army ants that I've been studying and uh, these fish schools, there's a danger, I think, in, certainly in the physics community, of what we call the reminiscence syndrome. You see one pattern and you think, well, you know, it's the same mechanism. These are completely different mechanisms. Very similar patterns, but completely different mechanisms. For example, in the case of the ants, this is a model here. It's, it's really this, they, they sometimes, especially when they get isolated by rain from the colony, they get locked into these circular type patterns, configurations, and it's interactions among the individuals and the interactions with the, 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 the feedback with the chemical trail lane that results in these circular type behaviors. And you know, within uh, fish schools, again, this could very much be an adaptive phenomena because it allows, and this is often uh, exhibited by predatory fish, that are quite large, they need to keep moving, they need to keep water going over the gills or else they'll drown. This is a good way for your group to stay in the same place yet keep water going over. Um, everyone's in the slipstream of someone else and they've still got local alignment. And that local alignment, as I'll discuss later, is important for information transfer. And this is just giving an example of what the, the model looks like. Um, and in these types of models, another thing that I've been thinking about a lot lately is, you know, we have this kind of averaging behavior. Now, this is the averaging of the attraction zone. This is the averaging in this, this alignment zone. We don't really know whether organisms are just simply just doing this averaging behavior. But they could be doing something much more complex than that. Um, but when we actually try to compare our models, these types of simulations, with reality, we do get a pretty good fit. If we look at the nearest neighbor distribution, for example, in this simple model, we get a very similar fit to, to the real data as we do in the experiments. And we also, as you increase the number of individuals in the group, the nearest neighbor distance decreases, the group compacts more, which is exactly what we find in reality. Um, here's some experiments I've been doing with Jens Kreiser at University of Leeds, where we've been putting food odor in the water so the fish think there's something to eat. Alarm substance is the opposite. They think a predator is present, but it isn't really. And we can look at control and, and both together. And we can look at the distribution of group sizes um, in the model as a solid line, and the dotted line is, is, is the experiment. So we get a very good match from these simple models with our simple experimental systems in the laboratory. Well, so it seems. Uh, but I think there's a lot more going on. When I look at these types of groups, I somehow think that our models aren't really capturing the essence of what's what's actually happening. Um, and Edmund Sells in 1905 wrote this amazing book, and he talks about these phase transitions, uh, where there's sort of the weary wayfaring, which is the sort of stationary group in the sky, suddenly turns to the swiftest arrows of triumphant flight, all become ecstasy for his epic song. You know, there's a mighty commotion, all sweep together into one enormous cloud. And he was astonished by these types of groups. You know, still these circle now dense like a polished roof, going disseminated like the meshes of some vast old heaven sweeping net. You know, a madness in the sky, he describes it as. He asks, you know, how without some process of thought transference so rapid as to practically simultaneous can, can this collective thinking be explained? Their little minds must act together, though I cannot understand it. It seems to me they must think collectively all at the same time, or at least in streaks and patches, a square yard or so of an idea, a flash out of so many brains. And if you read any literature about Celis, People dis discuss him as being a bit of a madman because he believed that these birds had thought transference, that they could automatically transfer thoughts. But that's because he didn't actually have any other potential explanation. If you read his literature more carefully, he's aware that that's a speculation. And so we now know that you know, when you, you track the motion of these organisms, that the waves of propagation propagate by 15 times faster than the maximum speed of the individuals, and this can be explained through our models. But what I don't think we've really got to grips with are the kind of collective uh, dynamical aspects of these groups that allow them to process information collectively and simultaneously. You know, simplistically, organisms, just by changing the range of interaction with each other, can dramatically change how information percolates across a group. If you interact only very locally, it can't percolate. If you interact over a very large range, there's so much averaging that these individuals here detect the predator, but these individuals, they're averaging everything so they don't get the information. At an optimal interaction range, you get the maximum percolation of information. And when we look at these types of groups interacting in the natural world, they're constantly dealing with perturbations. They're constantly dealing with 
with uh, multiple sources. I mean, they, these, these large starling flocks, those, those are the ones that Salas was, was actually describing. Um, you know, they, they are processing information. You can see these waves of turning across the group. But are these just simple averaging models sufficient? I think not. I think the, the individuals themselves are able to collectively change the behavioral rules that they use according to context. Um, it's quite fun, though, to play around with these models with, with predators and so on. But we really do need to go further, I think, than, than these descriptive studies. So the system itself, the system, the, the collective group, must act as an adaptive filter in the face of this environmental change. The social interactions act to amplify these weak signals, creating these proliferating waves. However, there's a trade-off. If you're amplifying all of these, these terms, then you're also going to amplify uh, fluctuations, random fluctuations, creating false alarms, and this could be very costly indeed. So the system itself must dynamically tune the system game according to context. So it's very interesting for us to think about how these different systems can adopt these different collective strategies to compute uh, things in their environment. So thus, like the brain, groups may adapt to compute the right thing at the right time. Um, so matching the collective information strategy with the statistical properties of the environment. And this is something that neuroscientists are very familiar with, and have been studying in great detail with even relatively small neural groups, but as yet hasn't been studied with, with animal groups. So in the very last part, I'm going to discuss some, some work we've been doing on tracking schooling fish. So these are some tracks, digital trajectories of fish within the laboratory. Um, and what we've done is we've looked at several species, very, very common species, basically the most common little species we can get and put in the lab and see what they do to see whether they conform to these types of models that we've been using. If we look at the roach, for example, these individuals, every time they make a movement, they bust and they glide, and they bust and glide, bust and glide, bust and glide. Every time they make a move, it's either to the left or the right by 15 degrees. They're making a binary choice. They're not doing the average of their neighborhood. They're just doing a binary choice, left to right, left to right, every time they move. So when we saw this, we thought, wow, this is great. This is very different to the models. This is giving us new ideas. So we decided to look at another very common species of fish, the killifish. When we looked in detail at the, at the movement, it was completely different to the roach. These ones don't have that left-right behavior at all. When, it, when we looked at how they want, you know, whether there were zones and how they wanted to be with respect to the angles of one another, they didn't really care. But what they really, really did care about was the speeds. So if we plotted the speed of the individuals moving straight, you can see that one, well, one individual in a tank will move with a sinusoidal speed. If we put two individuals together, they'll move out of phase with each other. In fact, almost always out of phase with each other, but sometimes exactly in phase. So if you think about it, if each individual here is an oscillator, it's a bit like a pendulum. Yeah, and if you're walking, you're stabilizing your center of gravity. There's only two modes that you can use. One is to walk, which is the, the oscillators being out of phase, and the other is to hop. And that's what the fish do. They go between this sort of walking behavior and this hopping behavior. An individual on its own will just oscillate on its own. It gets much more complicated. Um, so we can look at the frequency, for example. It's about one hertz, this oscillating frequency. And there's a much higher frequency here, and this is the tail beats of the individuals. So they're producing, constantly producing these tail beats, but they're adjusting the force they produce to produce a very near sinusoidal function. If we deal with four individuals together in groups, things get more complicated. What I was very interested in looking for were gates to see whether they would tend to, to synchronize in certain ways, in, 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 in typical ways that are quadrupeds. We're beginning some work with Naomi Leonard and Diane Swain at Princeton, where we, we're using this to develop new control theories, because in control theory and robotics, it, almost all control theory assumes individuals move at constant speed. And what we've now done is we've put in oscillating speed and found that the information transfer is much more efficient, especially during turns. Um, I think the abstract modeling is very important. I'm not trying to knock it at all. But I think there is a danger that we, we lull ourselves into a false sense of that, you know, understanding the system that we don't really understand. Um, the mechanisms in evolution of swarming may actually be very different, dif uh, different, something I'll discuss tomorrow. And this is important. You know, we do have to understand this if we're going to develop quantitative models of real systems, such as bacterial infection, plague insects. We do have to look at the biology. There are excellent mathematical tools out there. And I think it would be really, really good for us to think of a constructive way that we could begin to link together experimental theory. Because the very few experiments that have performed so far have completely changed the way we look at these systems. Uh, and that's, that's really all I have to say. Thanks very much.